It's the greatest gift from Allah to be in the last prophet. Summa salatullah wa salamullah ala al-hadi al-rasulillah. It's the greatest gift from Allah to be in the last prophet. Summa salatullah wa salamullah. Qad aflaha man zakkaha. That successful indeed is the one who purifies this nafs. You are fear for Allah, but you also fear other people? No. Don't fear anybody else, illa Allah, except Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is telling us, good words are better. Good words, words of advice, is better than the one who gives charity, but followed by reproach. So there are different levels of tests, and Allah decides who He's going to test. The first level of testing, of course, is with our own nafs. By his companions that Allah had mentioned, the noble description in the Holy Quran. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Hamdan Kathiran Tayyiban Mubarakan Fi, was Salatu was Salamu ala Rasulihi Muhammadin wa Alihi wa Ashabihi Ajma'in. Amma Badu Faudu Bilahi Mina Shaitan and Rajimi Bismillahi Rahman Rahim. ألم يأنن الذين آمنوا أن تخشى قلوبهم لذكر الله وما نزل من الحق ولا يكون كالذين أوتوا الكتاب من قبل فطال عليهم الأمد فقصت قلوبهم وكثير منهم فاسقون صدق الله العظيم الحمد لله all praises are for Allah as a wajal we thank Allah سبحانه وتعالى for his blessings for his favors, for each and everything that he has given to us in our lives. For certainly these things have been granted to us only by Allah, who has given us these things so that we will live comfortable on the face of the earth. So that you and I will be able to eat, you and I will be able to drink, you and I will be able to live a healthy life, you and I will be able to marry and have children and live a comfortable life. All these things are given to us to fulfill the needs and necessities that we all have on the face of the earth. It has not been given to us so that we will live in unmindfulness and neglect. It has not been given to us so that we will disobey Allah. Wealth is given to us so that we'll become charitable and generous. Not that we become stingy, not that we become misers. If we have strength and power, then that has not been given to us by Allah to oppress people or to be unjust to people or to be a tyrant to other people. These things have not been given to us for these reasons. But Allah has given us every single thing that we have so that we can use it in a manner that is beneficial to our own selves and beneficial to everybody else, those people who are around us. So we must recognize that. That a favor that Allah has given to us is not to be misused and abused. We have strength. We have health. We have the energy. How do we use that? Do we utilize it in the disobedience of Allah? Allah has given us this body, this energy. Some of us are strong. Others may be weak. They are few in number. But with that strength that Allah has given to us, we consume this strength, use this energy, use this energy to the extent that we tired ourselves in this world to the extent that we have not a minute to stand before Allah in Salat. Is this why Allah has given us the strength? We tire ourselves out. We exhaust ourselves. We exert ourselves to the extent from a.m. to p.m without bowing to Allah once during the day. And when the last salat of the night comes, we are saying that we are tired. Tired with what? And tired for what? Is this why Allah has given us this to us? If Allah wishes to take away our strength, and when we go to sleep, when we get up in the morning, we find ourselves crippled. We find ourselves having no ability to come off the bed. 
Then we will cry and say, oh Allah, why have you done this to me? Oh Allah, why, has my, have, why is it that my strength has gone? We complain. This is why the Holy Quran says that when man receives a favor from Allah, they become miserable. They forget about Allah. They become miserable. Getting involved in the favor they have been given. But when trouble touches them, they cry to Allah, Oh Allah, please relieve this from me. And then the Quran says that they go on to make promises. That if Allah relieves these things from them, then they will become better people. So we must understand that. That each and every one of us, we have so many things to be proud about. And we have so many things to be happy about. Because Alhamdulillah, Allah has made us in a good state. But this good state that we are in, if it's youth, if it's adulthood, good health, strength, ability, a few dollars in our pockets, how are we behaving towards these favors which Allah has given to us? Allah sends things and situations and he gives things to people, things to people only at times that he may test them. Allah will put to trial the wealthy man and he will put to trial a poor man. The trial that comes to the wealthy man is that would he be ready to part from a portion of his wealth, to give in charity, to give in zakat, to help his poor brothers and sisters, to remove the problems that other people have? Would he do this? Or would this wealth make him so greedy that although he has so much, he still wants the same amount and he will never ever be ready to part with a small portion of it. It is strange to know that Allah has ordered us to give such a small portion of our wealth, such a small portion, that it is absolutely nothing in comparison to the amount that he allows us to keep. Yet, there are more than 70% of Muslims in this country and probably other places who are not fulfilling the zakat in Islam. Allah has commanded us that from your wealth, when it has passed the minimum required amount, which is called an isab, give portion of it, give a portion of it to the poor and the needy so that you will help them in their situation. Don't give a half. Don't even give a third. Don't even give... You know, that amount that you feel like giving and giving and giving, you know, and your heart is not contented with it, Allah says, no. Just two and a half percent. That's all. Just two and a half percent. Which means, Allah is saying, you keep 97 and a half percent for yourself. Just a small, tiny bit that is called two and a half percent give. And although Allah is telling us to keep 97 and a half percent, and he says, part with this little bit, we say, no Allah, I want to keep all for myself. And we don't give anything in zakat. This is stinginess. This is greed. Allah tests, will put to trial people who have in that way. What will you do with this which I have given to you, Allah will say. And as for the poor man, he struck with poverty. Allah will also put a trial to him and all, Allah also will test him. In this state of poverty, want, deprivation and starvation, will, be, will he become a miserable person? Will he be someone who will be complaining and begging? Will he become disobedient to Allah? Will he turn against Allah? And will he say that Allah has not given him anything and Allah has ill-treated him? Allah will put a trial to him to see how much sabr, how much patience, and how much forbearance he has as a poor man. What would he do in that situation? So my dear respected brothers, my dear sisters, all these things that we live with, 
which Allah has given to us, certainly it is to make our lives comfortable on the face of the earth. Because of the fact that we are not living in a dream world, we are living in a real world. If you feel hungry, that's not a dream. You are in reality feeling hungry. If you are wounded by another person, that's not a dream. Like you had a dream last night, and when you got, get up this morning, you realize nothing, no blood is flowing from my body. No, it's real. Somebody causes harm to you, that's real. If you cause harm to somebody, that is also real. And every single thing that you see around you, and every thing, single thing that we see around us, from the daily occurrences, what happens to people, what we do and what we do not do, that is real. If we are hungry, as I said, and we do not eat, we will starve. If we do not eat and drink for a few days, we will die. That is real. That will happen. If someone takes a gun and he puts it towards you and he shoots you, that's not a dream. You will die. With all the trust we have in Allah, that is cause and effect. It will cause you to die. Somebody takes a knife and stabs another person, that's real. You will feel the pain. Everything around us is real. And we have grown accustomed with this real world to the extent that all or most of our hopes are pinned on this real world. That we firmly believe this real world has become so real to us that we firmly believe that if I do not work and I do not earn a salary, I will not get a provision. I will not get sustenance. It means, therefore, that this, if we want to say realness, if there is a word like that, the real power of the world has become so significant to us that we say if this is not done in accustomed to the way we normally do it, it can't happen. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already told us that before we even came on the face of the earth, our risk and our sustenance was already fixed by him. He will create ways and means so that you will get it. Whether you will earn it directly or it will be given to you by someone else, that sustenance which Allah has written for us will surely come and it will not miss us at all. But again, the example is just to show that everything around us is real. And it's so real that we really believe that if we don't do something, sometime we wouldn't get what the result is supposed to be. A person is sick, we know we have to seek medication, and we know that we have to take the person to the doctor. He's sick. But our belief in the real world is so much that we firmly believe if we do not take him to the doctor or get medication for him, he just cannot become better. Whereas it is otherwise in the sight of Allah. He cures, he gives sickness, he can, he can do anything he wishes. In fact, our iman is that although we may do so many things, our iman and our belief is that cure only comes from Allah and nobody else. We believe that. But yet we are not ready to take the chance to put that faith to the test. See, as Muslims, we all believe that. We believe that Allah alone can cure. We believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter what we use, if he decrees that there should be no cure, no cure will take place. And if Allah decrees that he will cure you without using anything, that will come to pass. It's the belief of a Muslim that this comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. It's our belief. Let's put that to a test. A person becomes sick. He is really becoming sick. 
and it is going down and down. And everybody says to him, we need to carry you to the doctor. And he says, I believe that Allah will cure me. I don't need to go to any doctor. We will look at that person strange. Now the thing is that, yes, we're supposed to go. We should go. That is part of our deen. There is no problem with that. But the thing I'm saying is that if this person expresses his belief and he says, that is my belief, that I really believe that can happen, our hopes, it is, they are pinned so much to the normal way things happen that we think that something is wrong with him. We will force him. We will drag him. We'll say he's getting mad. No, you must go. But as for the Sahabas, radiallahu ta'ala, they did that and they got relieved. They did exactly that. This is why on one occasion, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, the hadith is recorded by Imam Muslim, that 70,000 people from his ummah will go to paradise without having to go through reckoning and answering questions. They will go straight to paradise. Not a single question asked about the deeds. One companion got up and said, O oh, oh Prophet of Allah, make dua to Allah that I be from amongst them. The Prophet ﷺ said, Anta min whom you are from them. You will be from among them. And he sat. Another person got up and made the same request. The Prophet ﷺ said, he had already advanced you. With that. And when they asked the Prophet ﷺ, who would be these 70,000 people who would not have to go through any reckoning, answering questions, and they will go straight, straight to paradise. The Prophet ﷺ said, they are such people when they became sick and ill, they had so much belief, reliance, and tawakkul on Allah, they never ever used anything to cure themselves except that firm belief they had in Allah. Those are the people. So when people of that occupy such a high position, it means that can happen. And when Sahab, the Sahabas radiallahu ta'ala anhum did that, it means it happens. But then, when we become attuned and accustomed with what goes on around us, we think that that is probably a little bit too difficult. Or we may say, that is a little bit too extreme, when it is reality. But what makes us say that this might be ex an extreme situation, why would we say that person has been extreme? It's because of the fact that we have become so addicted with the way things occur on the face of the earth that it is real for us and we believe if it is not in that way, it cannot happen. My dear respected brothers and my dear sisters, just as we believe that everything is real around us right now, there is something real that will come after our life on the face of the earth also. And just as we believe everything to be real existing around us, one day another reality will come to us. And everything around us, it will be real also. This time will not be there. The people who surround you, they will not be there also. Everything you have earned on the face of the earth these things will not be there also. There will be no house for you. There will be no job and no car. There will be no wife. There will be no children with you. You and I, we will be all alone by ourselves. When we speak about it now, sometimes it comes to the minds that that is far-fetched. Probably it may not be like that. Probably it could be another way. But my dear respected brothers and sisters, just as we see everything real around us, we know people, we call people by their names, they respond to us. We see a figure in front of us, 
that can make us scared, we become scared. Just as this world is real to us right now, it will not be long before we go into another reality and everything around us will be very, very real also. It will be real. We pass by the graveyard. We see a grave. A man has been buried. He's in that small little, small little trench, dug up, probably about six feet deep. Length is about six feet also. Width, it might be about three feet. And we want to know, when he is there, two big huge angels are going to come to him. Where would they get placed to come? And then the man will be commanded to sit up. They will not ask him the questions when he's lying down. They will order him to sit up. Where is the space for him to sit up? When we know that when we buried him, we placed board over, over him. We didn't leave any space for him. And then we fill that hole or that grave with dirt right above the surface of the hood. Where will he sit? How can he sit up? And then we also hear about it will be expanded or it can close up on the individual. When we hear these things, it seems to be like, can it really happen? What I see to angels in the grave. Will somebody come to me and ask me about my religion and about my actions I did on the face of the earth? The answer to that is that it is really so. But because of the fact that those things are hidden from our eyes, it seems a little bit of farfetch for us. This is why, this is why this world for us seems to be very real. But when we go into the next world, that world will be even more real. So just as we grow accustomed to the reality that every, that of everything around us, and we get grooved in and groomed in into this life of work, of marriage, of having children, of eating, of drinking, of moving about, so too, the reality in that world is that we'll be sitting for a short while. And after answering the question, there will be one of two things. One is that of punishment and the other may be that of rewards. But as I said before, this seems... Like if it is not a reality to many of us and many Muslims, especially those people who are known to be believers. This is why in Surah Al-Anbiya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, depicting this sort of conduct from believers, depicting this sort of behavior from people in general, he revealed an ayah about that, a few ayats about that same conduct. The conduct is about where we treat serious things as a joke. Where we take serious things for granted. Where we take life for granted. Where we continue to live in the way we want to live. Say the things we want to say. Do the things we want to do without even thinking that one day we're going to drop dead. And we're going to be beneath the surface of the earth. No longer on top of the surface of the earth. So we take things as granted. And we continue to move on. And in the midst of all this happiness and enjoyment. And in the midst of passing our days and nights. Lo and behold. Someone strange stands before us. Ordering us to give up our soul. That's the time we begin to shake like a leaf. That's the time we begin to ask many different questions. So therefore. We find even in this world, although we know about what is coming in front of us, the conduct that is shown by some believers and people in general is that this thing seems to be something may or may not happen. In other words, they take it as a joke. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, indicating to that, He says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Iqtaraba lil-nasi hisabuhum wa hum fi ghaflatim mu'ridun The hour of reckoning has drawn close to man. Every day we live on the face of the earth, our time is becoming shorter. Every day we live on the face of the earth, the day of judgment is coming closer to us. Every day we live on the face of the earth, we are going further away from the date of our birth and we are completing whatever time Allah has placed for us on the face of the earth. Every day we live on the face of the earth, we take one footstep closer to the grave. Allah says the hour has drawn near. The hour is coming. The hour is soon approaching. It is coming to you. You are standing there. You are looking good. You are excited. You have a lot of dreams in your mind. And while you have all these things in your mind, the angel of that is visiting you very often and looking at you and say, where are you going with all those dreams? Don't you know after one week I have to take you? Where are you going with all these things? Why are you so joyful for nothing? Don't you know before you begin to experience that joy, I will have been commanded to take you already? Remember according to the authentic traditions, before the time of taking the soul, the angel of death has already given a list of the people, those people whose souls he will be taking. And the hadith also say that he visits them regular, regularly. And he looks at them. So he takes the list and he sees the name and he looks at a man. And it's like he's saying to the man, don't you know I'll come tomorrow for you? Why are you behaving in this way? So Allah says, اِقْتَرَبَ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ the hour of reckoning, the hour of judgment. And my dear respected brothers and my dear sisters, in one way, every day it can be the day of judgment for a person. In the sense that every day when he dies, that is it for him. The angel of death takes him. The next step is in the grave and questions begin immediately. When people walk away as the hadith mentions about when they have moved away and he can no longer hear the knocking of the what? The shoes or the slippers on the face of the earth. The angels appear. The munkir and the nakir, they appear. And they begin to question him. So Allah says, yes, it is drawing near. It is coming nearer and nearer. Once upon a time, an individual probably had 50 years to live. That is the time that Allah would have fixed for him while he was still in the womb of his mother. 50 years. But after the time he was born and he keeps on growing, it can't be 50 years. One day, it will come when he has one day remaining. The time will come when he has one hour remaining. The time will come when he has one minute remaining. And the time will come when the last second has been counted. When that comes, the angels have not been given the law from Allah to give them a chance. The Quran says, the time, he does not come before his time, nor will he come after his time, the angel of death. Yani, a person will not be taken before or after. Mind their respected brothers and mind their sisters. When that last second is counted, regardless of the state that a man or woman or child is in, the angel does his duty and he does it well. The last second can be counted and a man is sitting with the imam and his nikah is about to be performed. The angel appears, says, time, it's time to go, but not to your bride. It is time to go somewhere else. When that time comes to an end, you might be driving. You might be behind the steering wheel. The soul exits the body. You have no consciousness. Everybody says that he got in an accident and died. That's time your soul already left your body before the car went off the road. You couldn't drive again. You are in the beach taking a bath. 
The last moment comes right there and the angel appears right in that state. He grabs the soul and he goes with it. And a man drops down dead. Everybody says the man has drowned, but the man has not drowned. His time came to an end. He was in the water. The angel doesn't spare. The angel will not say, go home and meet your family and tell them that I said I'm coming for you. Bid them farewell and goodbye. The angel doesn't do that. Whatever state you might be in. The angel reaches right there. Allah says the time is coming and drawing closer and closer every day. But although it is coming close and we all know that. And not only the Muslims know that, but everybody to whom revealed scriptures came, they know that. In fact, the whole world is always preaching that the world is coming to an end and they give you the year also. So that's something everybody believes in. So Allah says the time is drawing closer. But what is the state of man? People know it is coming closer. People know they have to die. People are burying their brothers and sisters every day. And they are going to the graveyard. They are and actually they are seeing with their eyes a similar hole in which they will be going. Allah says but with all of that. With all that. That the reckoning is coming and they know it. And they know it and they know it. What is their state? وَهُمْ فِي غَفْلَةٍ مُعْرِضُونَ While the hour is coming closer, they remain in total unmindfulness. And they are turning away from the path of truth. So they know it's coming, but they are yet unmindful. They are yet unmindful. They are playing around. Everything seems to be a joke. It's like, just imagine if, subhanallah, you know what happened with the issue, the tsunami issue. They are similar, and there were similar tidal waves. So just imagine you are in some part of the world that you see this huge thing coming towards you. What would you do? You will stand up and laugh at it? Will you be like that? You will join the crowd and begin to run. You will run as fast as you can run. You wouldn't be there. You wouldn't stand up and look at it and smile. You wouldn't look at it and say, I think it's a joke. I think something is going wrong with my eye. Probably it's a mirage of a different nature. You wouldn't do that. Such fear will immediately come into your heart that you will run as fast as you can run. Allah says, this day is coming in your life. The judgment is coming in your life that is worse than all these things you can experience on the face of the earth. And still you are unmindful. Still you are looking at it. One day the Prophet ﷺ came in the masjid for salat and he saw some people at the back. They were giggling and gaggling and laughing. He turned to them and he says, if you remember your death, I will not see you like this. If you remember that one day you have to die and go in the grave, I wouldn't see you like this in the house of Allah. That, that cannot happen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this is drawing nearer. It is coming closer, but the way of man is that they are totally unmindful. مَا يَأْتِيهِم مِّن ذِكْرٍ مِّن رَبِّهِم مُحْدَثٍ not a single reminder comes from Allah. Not a single reminder comes from Allah. Every time we hear the Holy Quran, that is a reminder coming from Allah. Because the Holy Quran is the book of Allah. Allah has revealed in the Holy Quran what He wants to tell you and I. So when the Quran is being recited and translated, Allah is speaking to us. Allah is speaking to us. So... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, not a reminder comes to them from their Lord, illa stama'uhu, except they listen to it. They hear it. The Quran has been recited. The Quran has been translated. It has been told to the people that in the Quran, Allah says so and so. You must perform your salat five times a day. Allah from Allah. A dhikr, a reminder. So Allah says, not a single reminder comes to them. Except they hear it. They listen to it. But they are still playing around. Subhanallah. Allah says that's the behavior. 
They are still playing around. Just imagine. It's just like, let's try to understand the nature and how people behave by even drawing practical examples. You know about Salat is Farus. It's very, very important that every Muslim male and female perform Salat five times a day when it has become compulsory. No excuse for missing that at all. If you have to lie down and perform Salat, you have to lie down and perform Salat. It's not forgiven from anybody except those exemptions which are made in the Sharia itself. You are performing Salat. Your brother or sister at home, they are not performing. And whenever you are going to perform Salat, it's Salat boy. He watches us and laughs. You tell your sister, sister, it's time for salat. Salat is compulsory. That's the law of Allah. They look at you and you, they laugh like if you are making a joke. How would you feel about that? The month of Ramadan comes, you say it's for us for you to fast. They look at you and they smile and they say, what joke are you making? How will you feel about that? Allah says exactly how these people behave is exactly how they behave towards the commands of Allah. Now, Zabila, even our Muslims behave in this manner, fallacious for other people. Muslims sometimes think everything is a joke. But one day, as Allah is saying here, one day, that which they think was a joke, that they think which was a joke, will show up its seriousness in their life. So Allah says, this is their thing. Lahiyatan qulubuhum and their hearts are totally unmindful. Their hearts are totally unmindful of anything that is serious. And they continue to live their life thinking to themselves, everything is going good. Everything is in order. But as soon as the angel of death comes before them, as soon as the angel of death comes before them, then there is a whole different scenario altogether. Allah tells us what people will say at that time. When the angel of death appears, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَ أَحَدَهُمُ الْمَوْتُ قَالَ رَبِّ ارْجِعُونَ Lo and behold, when death appears before any person, he says, oh Allah, send me back to this life. Why will a man want to come back in this life? He says in the Quran, the Quran mentions that, لَعَلِّي أَعْمَلُ صَالِحًا فِي مَا تَرَكْتُ Oh Allah, I want to come back so I will do some good deeds which I neglected. I want to come back so that I will do some good deeds which I neglected. Oh Allah, you know many times I heard uh, I must do this as a Muslim but I just postponed it. I delayed it. I shoved it off thinking well probably at a later time. So Allah, there are many good deeds. There are many compulsory duties that I knew I had to do as a Muslim. But oh Allah, I am, I am accepting the fact that I have neglected it. But oh Allah, right now I am begging you for a chance to go back so that I may do these things. This will be the state of almost everybody who is in this position. Oh Allah, so that I may do some good deeds which I neglected. The announcement will come to him. Kalla, no way. There is no going back and there is no return to your world. Innaha kalimatun huwa qailuha. It is only a word you are saying, there is no meaning to it. How many times you were in a distress, distressful situation? How many times you were affected in so many ways and you were speaking from your heart to Allah? Oh Allah, if you only help me, I will do this and I will do that. Oh Allah, if you got me better, I'll do this and do that. Allah says it is only a word you are saying. وَمِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ بَرْزَقٌ إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ And before them will be the barzak until they are resurrected. So therefore, the Holy Quran in this ayah that I've quoted, it speaks about the behavior we see emanating from people. نَعُوذَ بِاللَّهِ May Allah forbid. Sometimes our Muslims behave in this manner also. People to whom the Holy Quran has come. People to whom this final revelation has come. The reminder, the Quran, Allah says people hear it and it's a joke. Their heart is unmindful. Everything is a play for them. We must not behave in that way. We must learn to take things serious. Whatever is serious, it must be treated in a serious manner. We'll close there and inshallah next week we'll continue with the topic. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
It's the greatest gift from Allah to be in the last prophet Summa salatullah wa salamullah ala al-hadi ya rasulillah It's the greatest gift from Allah to be in the last prophet Summa salatullah wa salamullah ala al-hadi ya rasulillah What can be said of Mustafa?